Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cassandra Taylor, and I am the founder and CEO of Top Flight Defense Incorporated. And today, we are coming to you with an excellent presentation on keeping your heart, oh, keeping a healthy heart. It goes close to my heart when I say that. <laughs> But uh, today we have our co-host who is Gabrielle Miller and she is a member of Iowa City Cedar Rapids alumni chapter of Delta Sigma Theta. And Gabrielle, if you would say hello and introduce yourself again to everyone and then we will go back and introduce um, the ladies that will be presenting today. Gabrielle. Hello everyone, my name is Gabrielle Malone Miller. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I just would like to extend a thank you from the president and chapter members of Iowa City Cedar Rapids alumni chapter of Delta Sigma Theta um, Sorority Incorporated. It is an honor to be a part of this experience and programming opportunity in regards to collaborating with Top Flight Defense Incorporated, but also to be a part of this opportunity in regards to working with these professionals in regards to bringing in this educational opportunity. Um, and so for those who are here, we hope that this is an educational moment for you all to be able to take um, some information back, but also begin to spreading this knowledge to those that you all are um, with on a daily basis, but also that is in your network as well. So thank you all for allowing us to share this space. Well, thank you so much for that. Thank you. And right now, I would like to turn it over to and introduce you to Dr. Tracy from Rush University Medical Center. She is um, one of my favorite doctors there, and I thank God that I never had to use her. Thank you. <laughs> but at the same time, she's presenting today and Without further ado, Dr. Tracy, introduce yourself and then we'll move on to the next doctor. Hi everybody, my name is Dr. Melissa Tracy. I'm an associate professor of medicine at Rush University Medical Center. I am the systems-wide medical director for cardiac rehabilitation. I am within Dr. Annabelle Vogelman's <laughs> Women and Heart Disease Center. I also am an imager and I'm our solid organ transplant cardiologist and the proud mother of three. Dr. Vogman and I combined our lectures. So I will be giving the lecture. And at the end, uh, Dr. Vogman and I will both be available for questions. I will run out um, as soon as I can, as I am also gonna be attending a yoga session tonight on behalf of uh, American Heart Association for Heart Month. So um, if you see me run out, it's only not because my heart is not with you guys, it's because I have to share my heart um, at a yoga session to talk about the benefits of yoga and cardiovascular disease. So I'll be talking about staying active and sane while social distancing and living in a healthy existence. So what can we do now to reduce our risk of heart problems later on in life? Well, there are several what we call modifiable risk factors. Modifiable risk factors means there is something we can do to change those risk factors. The non-modifiable non risk factors have to do with if we're male or female and our family history. Those are things that we cannot alter. So our genetics and our family history. The modifiable risk factors are as such smoking, if we have tendency or the, the risk factors for high blood pressure, obesity, and yes, we are still in a uh, pandemic of COVID and all of the other subsidiaries that it's called, but we have been in a pandemic of obesity in this world. Sedentary lifestyle, elevated cholesterol, sugar diabetes, and stress. 
And the one thing I will tell you that I'm probably going to add on here um, the next time that I give this presentation is that all of these are also part of something called the metabolic syndrome. And in addition, the number one reason, and this is not cardiovascular disease, but I have a captive audience, the number one reason in this country that there will be increasing need for liver transplants is obesity. When we overindulge and we take in too many calories and we become obese, it overloads our liver and that will be Obesity will be and is, I should say, the number one cause for liver disease in this country. So it is definitely a modifiable risk factor for cardiovascular disease, and it is a modifiable risk factor for non-alcoholic liver failure. These are some scary statistics, but they have to be said. Over 35% of Americans are obese with a BMI greater than 30 kilograms per meter squared. Diabetes in this country is rising. Pre-diabetes is at almost 40%. 30% in excess of 30% of Americans are inactive and 50% of Americans do not meet the minimum physical activity requirements. And at least 33% of our adult Americans have high blood pressure. And I want to echo that high blood pressure is called the silent killer for a reason. Because when it peaks, when your blood pressure peaks, a heart attack, stroke, or death can arrive. And a lot of people do not have symptoms relative to their high blood pressure until it becomes too late. One in three adult women have some form of cardiovascular disease. Women and men do have similar risk factors. However, I will tell you that women are great caretakers, but we're not great self-advocators. There are also those several female specific risk factors. There are disorders within pregnancy called eclampsia, peripartum cardiomyopathy. That's a weakness of the heart muscle that occurs during pregnancy. Eclampsia is severe elevation of blood pressure during pregnancy. But there can also be adverse pregnancy outcomes. So you can have post eclampsia, post pregnancy eclampsia, or post pregnancy high blood pressure, postpartum cardiomyopathy. There's also something called spontaneous coronary dissection, which can occur during or after pregnancy. And then there's menopause. And within menopause, that's a huge discussion in and of itself. And both Dr. Volgman and I see women that are peri and postmenopausal. And it is unfair. The symptoms that we will all or are going through, which include feelings of anxiety, feelings of depression, elevated heart rate, but also elevated blood pressure, elevated weight, elevated blood sugars. So during and post-menopause, there are also a lot of factors with our changes in hormones that can contribute to increasing risk of cardiovascular disease. The pendulum has shifted though. For those of us who do not have a contraindication to hormone replacement therapy. And typically the women who have contraindications are women with certain forms of cancer specifically, uh, and uh, very importantly is breast cancer, but if they also have any bleeding or blood clotting disorders. But for women who do not have a contraindication to hormone replacement therapy, the pendulum is shifting that low dose hormone replacement therapy for the shortest duration of time is acceptable to help women through their peri and postmenopausal symptoms. It's also important, ladies, that you don't feel that you have to be embarrassed or in shame of talking about these symptoms 
relative to peri or postmenopause, whether that is to your healthcare provider, but also to your friends, because your friends are most likely having similar or the same symptoms. So have a peri postmenopausal lunch and talk about this and have a support group. So the manifestations of coronary artery disease between men and women can be different. Women can have more atypical symptoms than men. So women may have more of a change in their exercise capacity or more shortness of breath with doing things. They may have more, more jaw or arm pain than men. But typically, the symptoms that occur with coronary artery disease typically are symptoms that develop with exertion. They go away with rest. And as the disease process is progressing, those symptoms will occur with less and less exertion until the point that they may be even occurring at rest. So typically there is a pattern to the symptoms, but women, you know your hearts and your bodies better. If there is something that seems off, please bring it to the attention of your healthcare provider. Women are more likely than men to have what is called non-obstructive coronary artery disease or microvascular disease. So if you think of the coronary arteries at the, as the oceans, and then the oceans break down into smaller bodies of water, women can have more disease in those smaller bodies of water than they can in those main coronaries. However, women also have smaller coronaries. Women can also have something called vasospastic disease. So their, their vessels quiver and can cause spasm. They also can have, as I alluded to earlier, more spontaneous coronary dissections. And what that is, is where the vessel walls, there's different layers to the coronary arteries. Those can actually break apart and blood can separate those vessels. As I said, women are more likely than men to have atypical symptoms. And women can have what is called more plaque erosion. Um, and what that is that the plaque, instead of closing and narrowing the orifice, the opening to the coronary artery, it actually invades into those muscular layers of the coronary arteries and then it can become unstable and break and cause a myocardial infarction. So there are certain things that we can do for our cardiovascular risks. What about statins? I know you all have probably heard about statins. Statins do tend to get a bad rep, but I have to tell you, statins are safe and statins do prevent disease. So the women who we would say no, you do not need a statin right now, are typically women who have a low risk, a low 10-year cardiovascular risk. And that's typically a 10-year cardiovascular risk less than 5%. We also do not recommend statins in women who are pregnant or are intending to become pregnant because what they can do, the statins can adversely affect the unborn fetus. The statins are definitely recommended for secondary prevention. So if a woman has already had a stroke or a heart attack or has had a cardiovascular event, we recommend statins. Women who have what we call primary hyperlipidemia with a bad cholesterol level of a greater than 190 milligrams per deciliter. Women who have diabetes and then women who have who are primary prevention, but whose 10-year cardiovascular risk is intermediate, greater than 7.5%. What about aspirin? Years ago, I used to say, once a man turns 45 and a woman turns 55, knee jerk, they need to be on an aspirin. Well, there was a very large retrospective meta-analysis done, and it looked at hundreds of thousands of patients and looked at the risks of aspirin versus the benefit. There are definitely benefits to aspirin of reducing cardiovascular events. However, that doesn't come without an increased risk of bleeding. 
So if the risk of bleeding is greater than the benefit to the cardiovascular system, we do not recommend an aspirin. So for primary prevention for healthy women with no major cardiovascular risk factors, we do not recommend aspirin. For routine use, even after the age of 70, we do not recommend aspirin. And if women have a high bleeding risk, but definitive women who need aspirin is for secondary prevention. If a woman has already had a cardiovascular event, a TIA, a stroke or peripheral arterial disease, we definitely recommend aspirin. There are ways to calculate risks. And so ladies, you can download these apps if you like. However, we do these in our office and there are different calculators that we can use to calculate the risk of heart disease in both men and women. It takes- Dr. Tracy, um, hold on one second. I had someone on Facebook ask a question that if you, if someone is on blood thinners, they shouldn't take aspirin. So Cassandra, do you mind if we hold the questions to the end? Would that be okay? Cassandra? Yes, yes. I'm okay? sorry, I muted myself, sure. Thank you so much. And I will be more than happy to answer that question because it's not an easy yes, no. So there are calculators. They take into account gender, age, race, and then our total cholesterol, our protective cholesterol, that's our HDL cholesterol, what our blood pressure is, and whether or not we are on blood pressure medication, if we smoke, and if we have diabetes. So listen, ladies, we can do this. I think most of us would aspire to be the family on the right, out in the bright, fresh air, with our families and getting in a nice brisk walk or, or jogging. The picture to the left, we should, none of us should aspire to. Sleeping on our sofa after we've had a meal with the remote, whether it's on our bellies or lying next to us, we should be aspiring to get out, exercise and have fun. I always think that this is a funny picture, but Dr. Vogman can tell you as well as I, we have both been witness to this kind of stall, even at our American College of Cardiology meetings, our American Heart Association meetings, where there's an escalator and everybody is waiting, but there's stairs right next to it. So ladies, this is one of the ways to get in your activity. Use the stairs rather than the escalator. Use the stairs rather than an elevator. How many of us have driven around for minutes upon minutes looking for a parking lot closer to the front of the building? Several of us. Stop going around and looking for the first parking spot and instead park far out into the parking, garage, parking lot or parking garage and walk. Dancing. There is so much that can be said about dancing. Not only is it a form of exercise, but it is a way for us to also invade each other's personal space. Personal touch is very important. So my kids and I, we put on our Sonos music almost every night. And whether we're dancing while we're doing the dishes or we then pull each other into an embrace, and we dance together. Dancing is a form of movement, fluidity, and it is really important to, like I said, not only dance for the movement part of it, but personal touch is always important. And no matter if you're man or woman, exercise is very important. For women, exercise is not only important for our cardiovascular, fitness, but also doing weights. The more muscle mass we have, the better because it protects our bones and it makes us a more efficient machine. How do we keep our weight down? We do it by two ways, reducing the caloric intake we're taking and by expending more than we're taking in. 
So we have to reduce the calories we're taking in and we have to use up stored fat and use up the calories that we're taking in. And also no matter what age, exercise does our body good. So this is really important because our young people are being coming obese. So we need to be advocates for ourselves, but we also need to be advocates for our children and advocates for the elderly because exercise is important and reduces risk at all ages. So how to exercise on our own? Find a family or family member or friend to help motivate us and exercise with us. Ideally, we should be exercising or moving. I like to use the word movement or fluidity because I feel like that may seem less intimidating. So movement, at least five times per week, 30 to 60 minutes per week. Now, it doesn't have to be in a gym. As you can see, these ladies are outside stretching together, but the walking up the stairs rather than the escalator or the elevator, walking to the front door of a grocery store or while you're shopping, standing rather than sitting at work, all of those minutes add up. Also varying the intensity. Don't become overwhelmed though. It's really important that you take it slow, make it gradual, but make it last. And add spice to your movement program. Our bodies get bored. So make sure you're spicing up the movement and fluidity that you're doing. And I like to think of exercise like showering. If I, don't, if I don't shower, I feel gross. I feel scuzzy. If you don't exercise, if you don't move and have fluidity in your life, it should not make you feel well. There are so many studies to demonstrate that active movement does so much good to our bodies physically, mentally, and emotionally. And as I said, weight training is very important. How do you spice it up? Well, jogging and brisk walking are historically the modes of exercise to achieve appropriate levels of derived cardiovascular benefits. But you can also cycle, swim, dancing, as I already spoke about. Yoga is a great form of exercise, and there's various types of yoga that can be done. And most important, have fun, enjoy, and make it comfortable. Sex uh, is important for us. Sex is a form of exercise. Obviously, I will not go into this in great detail because this is a topic that needs to be dealt with you and your partner in a safe environment. But sex is a form of exercise and it also increases intimacy, increases self-esteem and happiness. There's a 20 to 30% reduction in all cause mortality for patients who have known cardiovascular disease who adhere to a regular physical activity regimen. And this has to be incorporated into both their occupational activities and their recreational activities. And we have to address the readiness and the barriers that patients have to achieve their physical activity levels. There are different ways of calculating where you should be exercising. 220 minus your age times 0.75 puts you in the zone of 75% of your targeted heart rate. And so before you just get out there and run, calculate this and know that you need to warm up. So that's a lower heart rate. Then once you get into your warm up, which typically is about five minutes, then get into that aerobic zone, roughly that 75% of your maximum predicted heart rate. You, there's no need to get to, into what is called the anaerobic zone. That's for training for a, a, an event. That's for elite athletes. But improvement in cardiovascular outcomes is based on what we call a cumulative amount of activity and not necessarily on binging. As I already alluded to, weight management is a big problem. If you just look at these statistics, the US is in red, the other uh, graphs are for the other 
uh, civilized or uh, nations that we typically compare our health to. These are not second world, third world countries. And the United States is leading the way in obesity. This is not something for us to be proud of. And this is multifactorial. This is because we've increased portion sizes. And look at the size of these burgers. These burgers really do exist. There are people who really are eating these burgers that have, what are there, nine patties on there? This is, this is obscene. So we have to reduce obesity in this country if we're going to have an impact on cardiovascular disease. The AHA scientific statement has stated Exercise should be viewed as a preventive medical treatment, like a pill that should be taken on almost a daily basis. Exercise reduces our health problems, such as depression, anxiety. It improves our cognition, reduces cardiovascular disease, stroke, diabetes, and mortality, lowers blood pressure, increases metabolism, improves our lipids, facilitates circulation, so for people who have peripheral arterial disease, strengthens our heart, and is critical for stress management. You don't have to, though, go to perfection. Do it, do it badly. Anything worth doing is worth doing badly the first time, even the second or the third time. I love this quote. If you learn from it, it's not a mistake. So mistakes don't exist. Learn from it. Learn to also compromise. When in a dispute, whether it's with your body, with your friend, with your family, with, a, with your spouse, find a way to come to a common ground. So make sure you're working on stress management. And one way to work on stress management, I've already stated, is exercise. But also changing our perception of perfectionism, that we have to have everything, we have to do it right, and learning to compromise. And it is really important, adding good sleep. The American Heart Association has really been pushing this, that good sleep hygiene is very, very important. When you don't get enough sleep, everything feels worse. But in addition, when you don't get enough sleep, you are at a higher level of stress. When you don't get enough sleep, blood pressure can go up, heart rate can go up. In addition, if you have been told by your healthcare provider, that you may have something called obstructive sleep apnea. Please don't ignore this because this obstructive sleep apnea can have adverse effects on our cardiovascular system, not only on our blood pressure, but also on our right heart, resulting in right heart failure, and it can result in arrhythmias, irregular heart rhythms. In addition for stress management, develop a positive attitude. Start each day happy and positive. I've actually subscribed to a quote. So every day I get a positive quote and I love it. Some, some days it doesn't fit me, but for the most days, I, I read it almost every day. And Dr. Vogman can tell you, I send these on to a lot of my colleagues and friends. And we have a quote in our house, and this is a quote, all days are good days. Some are just better than others. And my kids know how much this means to us. We can have life-changing events. And my family, we have had life-changing events. And the fact that we can wake up every day and see each other every day, all days are good days. Some days are just better than others. And wait to worry, postpone the worry, set aside each time, for self-reflection, meditation, and yoga. And I love to give back to others. Part of why I'm doing this lecture selfishly is to give back because I feel really good when I'm done with this time with all of you. I feel really good that I've possibly, and I hope that I've had a positive impact on many of you, if not all of you. 
COVID has transformed us all. This is a very new phase in all of our lives. It feels weird, but weird is not bad. Weird is okay. So don't get hung up on the fact that we, we are and we'll, we will have a new normal, but also focus on the sameness that we have. So understand that we are in a new normal. We will set a new normal and not just for COVID. I can't tell you how much the news bothers me. I cannot tell you how much listening to the news bothers me. Uh, so relative to COVID, relative to racial indiscretions, relative to police violence, we're living in a, a really disturbing time. But I'm confident that we will achieve a new normal because I'm confident that the majority of us in this world will understand that we are here together for a common goal. But with all of that's happening in this world, it does result and can result in anxiety. So deep breaths, be rational even when there's people around us who are not. And deal with the grief of what's happening with us because there is grief. Deal with the grief of what we have missed out over the last several years because of COVID and not being able to travel. But realize that we will, and hopefully we are developing a new normal and that we will all come out of this in a better way. Track your progress, setting goals is really important. Most of us have some type of uh, technology that we can set a limit on our use of technology, uh, set a limit on what technology our kids are using, but also set goals for how many steps we're doing per day. And also we can use this technology to see how well we're sleeping at night. So track your progress, but also limit the use of technology. So the key takeaway messages, ladies, heart disease is the number one killer of women and men. Heart disease though is preventable. Knowing your personal risk is first powerful, life-saving step of a heart healthy life existence. Love your heart. Improve your lifestyle to include exercise, heart healthy eating, and please do not smoke. You have dealt with so much and done the best that you can. Take a moment now to appreciate how strong you are. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Dr. Tracy. Oh my goodness, you! I'm sitting up here watching this and exercising. I'm stretching. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Thank you. Over, yes, I'm sitting over here taking the stretching this way, and then I'm stretching the other way. Yeah, this is um, that was amazing, and I appreciate all of that that you gave. Um, so, do you want to answer? answer the question or do we wait till after Dr. Vogelman and then we do the question? So answer the question. That was our lecture for both Dr. Vogelman and myself. Oh. Yes, oh, I, okay. I combined it. I combined our lectures. Um, Annabelle, do you want me to answer about aspirin and uh, anticoagulants or would well, you like to? to I, I can I can start and maybe you can um, chime in and if you have a, a, you know, a different opinion or if um, you have something to add. So the question I believe was, um, should I stop, take, should I not take aspirin if I'm on a blood thinner? It's a well, really- She well, didn't ask, should she stop? Her question was, so someone on blood thinner shouldn't take aspirin. Yeah, um, so similar. Um, it's a very complicated answer. <laughs> because it really depends on what um, the diseases are. There are several conditions, heart conditions um, that require both. So for example, if you have atrial fibrillation and you have high risk for stroke, you need a blood thinner. But if you also have um, coronary artery disease, which can cause heart attacks, you may need a baby aspirin 
in addition to that blood thinner. And we sometimes have to put patients on both of them. But if you don't have either one, you should not be taking uh, aspirin or um, a blood thinner if you're not at high risk. I like don't know if any of you yeah, noticed, um, Dr. Er, Dr. Um, President Biden had his uh, physical and President Biden is on a blood thinner. I think it was Eliquis, I don't remember, but it mentioned that he's on a blood thinner and he's on a cholesterol lowering medication. And he was on uh, three other medications. One was one or two of them were for allergies. The point being is President Biden is 80, I believe he is. Mm -hmm. And he is not on an aspirin. He is only on his blood thinner because they mentioned that he does have atrial fibrillation. So if you have atrial fibrillation or you have a heart valve that requires you to be on a blood thinner, but just like Dr. Volgman said, you do not have cardiovascular risks. You don't have other risks that put you at a high category. Then you don't need the aspirin. But the other thing that President Biden has is he does have cardiovascular risks, but his risk of bleeding great outweighs the benefit of him being on both. So he has risk factors. He's a man, he's 80, he's high cholesterol, but his risk of bleeding at 80 great outweighs the benefit of him being on an aspirin and a blood thinner. So he and his doctors have taken a collective decision. So this is a, a collective decision. That's really, really important. And that's why it wasn't an easy question to answer, Cassandra, okay. is that it takes a balance of benefit versus risk. What is the benefit to the agents, the blood thinner and the antiplatelet agents? And what is the risk of bleeding? And so this takes a collective decision making between you and your healthcare provider. Okay. Um, so there was something that came on the news the other day after the football player had went into cardiac arrest on the football field. A doctor came on and said that there's, it's two different things. People say a heart attack and cardiac arrest, and they are two different things. I didn't know that. So for some people that did not hear that on the news and didn't understand, can either one of you explain the difference of the two and what it is? I'll take that on, um, uh, Melissa, because we just talked about that uh, at the AHA um, board meeting yesterday. So they had a great slide. A heart attack is a is a, um, a plumbing problem. You have a blood clot that is blocking flow of blood into the muscle. That's a heart attack. So if you the longer that clot blocks the blood flow to the muscle, the more damage there is to the muscle, and that's what a heart attack is. A cardiac arrest, which is what um, the football player had, um, Mr. Hamlin. Um, had an electrical problem. So, the, uh, so a cardiac arrest is a, an electrical problem. He didn't have a heart attack. He had an electrical problem. The, the fact that he was hit and, and I, you know, I can't say for sure, but our theory is that he had a myocardial contusion, which is a bruise on the heart that he got hit in the chest. And that can sometimes trigger an electrical problem of the heart and you, meet, you need immediate CPR and a defibrillator to treat that condition. And the sooner that happens, the less damage there is. And, and I just saw him at the uh, Super Bowl. He looks fabulous. Yeah. Um, so they did a did. great job resuscitating him. And that's what needs to happen with every cardiac arrest victim. And unfortunately, that is not what's happening in, in the real world. Okay. Um, can you do me a favor, Dr. Volkman? We didn't um, get an introduction of who you are and what you oh. do. <laughs> and because I'm like, you pop in, it's like, mm, we, she needs to tell you about who she is. 
So I'm Dr. Annabelle Santos Vogman. I am a cardiologist at Rush University Medical Center. I have the pleasure of working with Dr. Tracy. We love working together. Um, we started the Heart Center for Women 20 years ago. So we're celebrating that 20 year anniversary. Um, so we're very, very happy about that. And uh, people have been very supportive of it. And I am an electrophysiologist by training, and that's why I wanted to take that cardiac arrest um, question, um, which means that I take care of patients with palpitations, with arrhythmias. Um, but when I started the Rush Heart Center for Women, I started taking care of patients with general cardiology problems. So I've been at Rush for 32 years, and uh, I probably will retire from there, not taking another job. <laughs> Okay, well, this is this is for everyone on here. This is their third year partnering with Top Flight coming in on in February to talk about a healthy heart. Um, some of you may or may not know I am a Rush employee, and um, I tend to tap on their doors and be like, "Hey, you feel like doing a class for Top Flight?" And Dr. Tracy and Dr. Vogelman jumped at the opportunity. I didn't have to ask them twice. Um, when I ask them again, every time I ask, it was like, yes, when is it? And mm -hmm. we just go back and forth. And I just want to tell you ladies how much I appreciate you bringing so much knowledge to this forum, to this platform, because this is, this is really needed. I've had so many family members and friends, some passed away of a heart attack or cardiac arrest, and there's others that survived it. And I, there were two people actually on the call that are survivors, but I think they may have dropped off. But I just want to tell you, ladies, thank you from my heart to your heart. <laughs> I want to say thank you. I want to um, now hand it over to the president of um, Delta Sigma Theta. She want to end some in with a quote or a comment or a thank you to the ladies. And if she's if she has something else she's doing, then Gabrielle, can you chime in in closing remarks? Um, okay. I'm not sure if our president is our president. Speaking? Yes. Is she still on chapter president? Christine. Yeah. I don't know if she's still on. I can go ahead and um, close this out though. Um, for those who have um, participated with us, just wanted to again, um, extend a warm thank you for being with us here today um, and being a part of this experience. Um, we hope that this has been an amazing opportunity for you all. I um, mean, like stated before, we hope that this information um, not only has been retained and received, but it also goes back with you all um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And like the doctor said, hopefully you all will begin to um, begin to transform your lives because because that is the point of um, these presentations to begin to take action, to begin to make some shifts in your lives in order to make sure that we are becoming our greater selves to become the people that we are destined to be. So again, thank you all for being here with us and um, we hope to see you all in um, future presentations. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sora. And thank you ladies. Um, just want to say continue to follow Top Flight on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We have our YouTube channel. So this session is being recorded and will be uploaded to um, YouTube. So find it, follow it, and enjoy it. And, and ladies, please, I just said. Use, um, please attach us if you tweet this out to um, Dr. Volgman and I. Okay. Um, Email me your tweet address or have sure. because I know I'm going to put it on LinkedIn and I'll I are you on Twitter? Um, if it if it's on LinkedIn, you just I think just uh, 